following message is presented by Community Gospel Church in Bremen, Indiana. It is our great privilege to share this ministry with you. We in no way intend for this to be a replacement for the local church. It is our prayer that this would serve as a resource to help make Jesus Christ known in our congregation and other congregations gathering across the world. For more information about Community Gospel Church, visit www.communitygospelchurch.com. The rest of us, if you would open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians is where we're going to be at today. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, not Acts. We've been going through Acts for a while. Um, 1 Corinthians is a little farther than Acts. So you're going to go Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament. You're going to hit Acts and then just keep going. You'll find 1 Corinthians. You can use the flip method, and that's where you just flip in your Bible until you find the right book. Anybody done that? All right, I'm glad I'm not all alone by myself up here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We are in Easter season. Easter is an old word. It means east. And uh, it is also the name of a springtime month. Thank the Lord for nice weather. I uh, use this very sparingly, but I hate the snow. Okay, so there's my confession to you guys. Um, And I put up with it because Bethany is gorgeous and I love her. And that's why I like, and that's why we have snow. So anyway, uh, some people believe that Easter is a pagan holiday. There's real little evidence to prove that is true. Um, there's a lot of people that speculate that Easter has kind of come about because of a worship of an old goddess. Uh, but we know that there's not um, real significant evidence to prove to that. What we do know is that it's very commercialized. Amen? Um, we have things like Easter eggs and Easter candy And we have a creepy Easter bunny that sits in the foyer of this church. And I'm to blame because we bought that dummy. And Dean and Diane Holdeman are to blame because they put the suit on that bunny. Side note, right? My office is right over here. And every time that I need to go to the restroom, we have to go down this hallway and you turn the corner to the bathrooms that are located over here. And that stupid bunny sits right in line. And nobody's in the church, so I always jump when I see him as I turn the corner. And I'm like, I don't want to go to the bathroom anymore. So (laughs) our children may go on Easter egg hunts. And, you know, some people wrestle with whether or not Easter is a good thing or a bad thing. And it's not necessarily bad that our kids go on Easter egg hunts and they do some of these Easter things. The biggest thing, though, is we need to make sure that our focus is always on Jesus, right? Jesus is the reason for the season, and we realize that Jesus is also the reason for the resurrection day. So a different name for us as believers that we call Easter is resurrection day. It is the true meaning of Easter, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so for the next three weeks, we're going to kind of help all of us to either be reminded of the real reason for Easter or for those of us who might not know about Easter to know what Easter is truly all about and how we got to where we got. And so Christ works on our behalf and it is a glorious time for us to celebrate all that he has done. He is alive And I think of all these crazy hymns that we used to sing when I was a kid around Easter time. For example, up from the grave, he arose, right? So I'm like a little kid at Easter time. I just automatically start having these weird memories. So if something kind of hardwires in me and I shut down, it's because I had a a bad thought. (laughs) Okay, let's pray together and ask God's blessing upon his word. Heavenly Father, thank you for your truth. We thank you for what it means uh, that it is truth that we can have truth and that it comes from you. And we thank you for Easter, the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, who gives us life, not just here and now, but for eternity. Gives us the opportunity to have a relationship with the creator of the universe. Sometimes we forget how blessed we really truly are. We need to be reminded of the truths in Scripture We need to live out the truths in Scripture, and we need to be clear on them. So that's the prayer this morning, that you would just help me be clear as we teach from your word, and that we put this truth into practice in our everyday lives. May it be your words and not mine as we 
talk here today and as we converse. I pray a blessing over all of these people who are gathered here and those who are joining us online. In your name, amen? Amen. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to be in verse 12 through 19. In the previous verses, you need to know something before we get to verse 12, and that is that Paul has already been speaking a great deal to these Corinthians. That's why it is called Corinthians. He is speaking to these people about Jesus, and he's laid a very good foundation of the resurrection of Christ. It is essential to the gospel, that is, Christ came, died, and rose again. What is the gospel? The gospel is that Christ came, died, and rose again so that you and I could have a relationship with God in faith. He's already walked through that, and he said that if you deny Christ and His resurrection, you essentially deny the whole structure of this Christianity. You deny the preaching. You deny the practices. You deny all of the things. If you don't have Jesus raising from the dead, we have nothing. He'll say in a little bit that our faith would be futile. And so as Paul kind of sets into motion all of these things, he wants us to see that the resurrection of Jesus Christ has a future for us as believers that we too will rise again. He also wants us to know that it delivers uh, the kingdom back to the Father and it defeats all of our enemies. I don't know who your enemies are or some of the things that you're dealing with in your life, but I need some help in mine. And Jesus comes and He gives that help because He helps us overcome things because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul wants us to know that. It's the centrality of the message. If we miss the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there's dangerous consequences in our everyday existence. We don't have any hope. We don't have any peace. And that's what Paul has already articulated for us before we get to verse 12. Verse 12 says this, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12. <clears throat> now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If Christ has been risen from the dead, how could some people sit there and say, Jesus didn't raise from the dead? Well, circle that word, if you would, in your Bible, some. All the apostles have affirmed that Christ came, died, and rose again. But there were some who believed that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. We believe that these people are essentially upper class Corinthians who like to sit around and philosophize about life, about existence, and about what we're here for. What is our purpose? Those upper class people, man. What are you going to do with them? One commentator says that they knew enough philosophy to distance themselves from end times worldview. In other words, they didn't like to think about death. And they saw Paul as an unsophisticated Jewish preacher. They looked at him in a little bit different light than what other people looked at him. Now I pause here for a second because I think this is interesting. We as believers have to be careful here because we can get up uh, we can get caught up in the world's missing genealogies too, can't we? Paul will write to a young Timothy, a preacher of a congregation, and he'll tell him, he'll say, Timothy, you need to be careful getting caught up in the philosophies of the world and thinking about some of the philosophies of the world. If Paul were here today, he would say, listen, church, you've got to be careful about getting caught up in that quote that you found on social media because it might not be parallel with what the Word of the God preaches. He says, you've got to be careful about what you read and make sure that you check it against the Word. He says, we cannot be devoted to the world's viewpoints and God's world, Word at the same time. You cannot serve two masters, is what Jesus would say. Speaking primarily about money, but it goes beyond that into philosophy. John will tell us in 1 John chapter 2, do not love the world or anything in the world, which includes the worldly viewpoints. If anybody loves the world, the love for the Father is not in them. And loving the world often means being devoted to worldly ideas. Are you devoted to worldly ideas? 
Are we willing to look in the mirror and think, man, do I think that way because God's word says that? Or do I do think that way because what I read on social media or what I heard from the workplace or what the mom's group told me, not our mom's group, another mom's group, <laughs> said? Do I think this way because God teaches it or do I think this way because I have been influenced in a way by the sum? Loving the world often means being devoted to secular ideas. Be wary of anything that competes with God for our highest affection, which includes the battle for your mind. God says, I want you to think. I want you to think according to my word. Now, what are these some against? Good question. I'm glad you asked. It says, if you continue in verse 12, that they are against the resurrection of the dead. The Corinthians believed in an afterlife. But they took a little bit of a, what is called a dualistic anthropological approach to humanity. That's fun, right? You learned a new word today. Dualistic anthropological approach. I was praying that I said that right, and I think I did. So good job, Jordan. This was according to how they were raised. They were Hellenists or Greek speaking. And according to their tradition, humans had two inharmonious parts. Hence, dualistic. One was the body and the other one was the soul. And they said that they were not equal. So they believed that when somebody died, the body shed like a snake skin and it was left in the ground, but the soul went and carried on forever. It was like Casper, the friendly ghost. It just goes up into the sky. You laugh, but people believe that stuff is true. Crazy. <clears throat> they believed that it went into a spiritual existence. Now, you laugh, but some of us are sitting here this morning and we're thinking to ourselves, wait, hold on, Pastor Jordan, isn't that how it works? Isn't that what happens to us? Well, the Bible says that after death, believers' souls or spirits, if you have a dualistic or a tri approach to our existence as humanity, in other words, you think body, soul, and spirit, or just body, soul, slash, spirit. Pastor Jordan believes body, soul, slash, spirit. We're not going to debate that today. Right? That's a different sermon for a different day. And you could just roll with me for a second because those words are interchangeable and I can prove it according to Scripture, but we're not going to do that today, okay? <clears throat> In Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, it says, For believers, death means we are away from the body at home with the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians 4, it affirms this. It says, Believers are given glorified bodies... And the souls slash soul spirits go to be with Christ immediately after death. So get this, if you know Jesus, okay, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, when you die, you go to be with Christ. Absent from the body, present with Christ. Praise the Lord, amen. Right? Okay? And your body essentially sleeps for a little bit until it is raised on the resurrection of the dead. These people don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. And let's just praise the Lord that we get glorified bodies that don't look like our bodies that we have today. Amen. Man, there's so many imperfections. I look at it, I go, God, can you Photoshop this a little bit for me? Right? He says we get glorified bodies at the resurrection of believers when the physical body is resurrected, glorified, and reunited with the soul, which will be our possession as believers for eternity as Revelation 21 says, in the new heaven and the new earth. Whew. What if I don't know Jesus? What if I don't have a relationship with Jesus? Similar thing, except you don't go to be with Jesus. The worst part about hell is that you spend an eternity away from the existence of a perfect creator. I think some people get caught up and they say, hey, if I don't trust Jesus Christ, I go to hell. Better to rule in hell uh, than to exist in eternity in heaven. That's false. Okay? Because can you imagine living in eternity away from the existence of a creator? People who don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior are living literally in God's mercy and grace at this moment. That will cease if they choose to continue to reject Jesus Christ as Savior. They will be forever away from Christ and sent to the lake of fire, Revelation 20 tells us, and they will not be with the Lord and they will not be with His presence. Now, Jesus talked about this a little bit when He talked about seeds. The entire genetic code for an, uh, for a, excuse me, an oak tree is contained in the kernel of an acorn. Did you know that? I had no idea. I learned something new. 
the entire genetic code for that tree is in the acorn. But what does the acorn have to do? Be eaten by a squirrel. Nope. It has to go into the ground and it has to die. It has to go through the process of fermentation in order for it. Uh, did I say fermentation? I don't know if fermentation is the right word there. So don't, don't write that down. Um, <clears throat> we'll just say triggering, okay? It has to go into the ground and it has to trigger new life to produce the plant that's more glorious than the seed. You have to die in order to be more glorious than you are at this current moment. Okay? Jesus spoke about this. He talked about this. He preached on this. When we die, our resurrected bodies will bear a resemblance to the body that is buried with far greater glory. We'll be ourselves only perfect, but those who rejected Jesus Christ will continue on in death and away from the existence of God's presence. The seed cannot produce growth if it rejects growth. So before we go running into this whole argument on does the body have two or three parts or what is really going on here in regards to the Corinthians, it, it falls to one simple statement, and that is, do you know where you're going when you die? Because Paul says to the Corinthians, he says, listen, there's a resurrection of Jesus Christ, and what happens after you die affects the decisions that you make here on this earth. It is so vital that they would realize that they will rise again either in eternity with Christ or you will rise and be in eternity away from Christ. It's always Jesus. It's always preached about Jesus. These are the final eternal destinations. There's no third way. There's no fourth way. There's no fifth way. Okay? And so what he says is your eternity is based on whether or not you trust Christ for salvation. Do you know where you're going? If there's anything that we can drive home this Easter season, it is that we need to know where we're going. And we pray that you would make the decision to trust Jesus Christ as Savior. <clears throat> now, all these people sit around and they philosophize. <laughs> so Paul plays along a little bit. He goes, okay, let's, let's play along. What if Jesus never raised from the dead? I'll play along with you guys. What would happen? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 13. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Jesus Christ has been raised. You cannot believe in the resurrection of Christ and not the resurrection of the dead, he says. 14. If Christ had not been raised, number one, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Just stick with that first one. Our preaching is in vain. First consequence. The word preaching there is a word that means not the act of preaching, but the content contained in the message. Have you ever heard a sermon and walked away and just felt empty? You're like, yeah, man, two weeks ago, Jordan, it was you. Don't say that. That hurts me. We walk away sometimes from messages and we just feel empty. It's like driving on the road and you see a billboard that just doesn't resonate with you. There's no substance to it. And you think to yourself, man, it's just an empty message. It doesn't make sense. Paul says here that the content of what is preached is important. And he uses the word useless, meaning empty. If there's no resurrection of Christ, then his preaching and all the apostles' preaching has no substance to it. It is in void. <laughs> My kids and I, uh, we've been kind of revisiting old movies, right? From the 80s and 90s, and I'm kind of reliving my childhood with them a little bit. And I'm justifying it as we go, so don't, don't judge just yet. And there's a movie that's, uh, that I haven't showed them yet that I'm really thinking about showing them. It's uh, the Robin Williams movie, Hook. You guys ever seen Hook? What a great movie. In, the, in Hook, though, he's sitting there at this table, and this is really interesting. Do you remember when the Lost Boys, they're all eating, and there's nothing in the bowls? And they're like scooping it out, and then they're throwing it at each other. And then when I was a kid, I was like, that's so awesome. And Robin Williams is so confused because he can't see the food that's in the bowls. Why not? He doesn't believe. And so... What Paul's saying to the Corinthians is he's saying, listen, we're all sitting at the table right now. And those of us who believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior, we can see the substance. But if you continue to reject him, you can't see the substance of what we're preaching. 
It's the same thing today. You can't see the substance of what is preached unless you go live it out in the community that is entrusted to your care. You can't sit here and uncover all the biblical doctrine that we uncover and say, yeah, Jordan, that makes sense. It won't make sense until you go live it out. It won't make sense until you believe. It won't have substance until you believe. And we believe that the gospel is useful. So everything that we do has a messianic lens on it. It's all about Jesus. If Jesus has impacted your life, it should impact your workforce. If Jesus has impacted your life, it should impact your marriage. If Jesus has impacted your life, it should impact your kids. Like, this is so important. you got to act like Jesus or else you don't have any substance in your life. And Paul's like, if you listen to anything that we say as apostles and preachers of God's word, it's that we're giving you substance, but that substance doesn't work until you go live it out. So don't just sit in the congregation in the pews and just soak it up and become puffed up with knowledge. Go live it out and prove to God that it is true. Paul says, if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then preaching is useless and my testimony means nothing. And then he says in verse 14, man, I'm wound up today, I'm sorry. And 14, he says, uh, not only that, your faith is useless. Now, if you bounce down a little bit in 17, the first part, he says it again. If anything is written in scripture twice, you need to pay attention to it a little bit closer. Essentially, the translation means of a void. Your faith without the gospel is futile, he'll say in 17. It has no legs to stand on. I'm going to go back to my kids for a second because we've been teaching them Bible lessons and um, we've been walking through kind of Bible lessons. And you remember the Bible lesson about the man who built his house upon the sand and the waves came up and what happened? And poof, down like the walls of Jericho, right? But what did the wise man do? Oh, you know the song, right? The wise man built his house upon the rock. You just have to finish it. It's so funny for those of us who grew up in church. If you didn't grow up in church, yeah, you're all right. Don't worry about it. It's all good. We're just going to have our little family reunion here for a second, and then we'll come back. But in Matthew chapter 7, listen to this. This is Jesus. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise man who built his house upon the rock. Our faith, our house is steady. It's solid. It's unshaken. Because our house is built on the rock. The cornerstone, Jesus Christ. We have faith to believe that he can do what he says he can do. I have so many testimonies of all of you who come at me every single week and you tell me of the stories of what God has done in your life. If Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead, then what you're saying is useless. And it's, it's, it is void. It's futile, but that's not true. We know it's not true because we lived it out. I love what the psalmist says in Psalm chapter one. He says, we're like trees planted by the riverside whose leaves don't wither. Third thing he says, look at verse 15. <clears throat> he says, we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not see if it is true that the dead are not raised. What he says here is he says, listen, if Christ didn't raise from the dead, preaching is useless. If Christ didn't raise from the dead, your faith is useless. And if Christ didn't raise from the dead, every message that you heard from the apostles is useless. Or literally, they would be caught like crooks. He essentially says, listen, all these guys who have come preaching in the name of Jesus, they're, they're fakes. They're like when you order that thing uh, on, on, online because of the advertisement uh, algorithm hits you right in the gut and you get it from Amazon and you open it up and you're disappointed me in my life <clears throat> now listen to this because this bounces back to the Old Testament to be a false witness against men is one thing it's against the ninth commandment so what Paul essentially says is hey if all of these apostles okay if all of these guys are false they broke the ninth commandment he says but wait hold on a second but if they broke a commandment to God that's higher in the sin category than it is to break the commandments. And if we go back, look what Paul already outlined in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 5. He says, I want to show you that we're not lying. He says, and then he appeared. Who's he? Jesus and Moses, baby. You can't go wrong if you're in church. You always say Jesus and Moses. <clears throat> he, Jesus, not Moses, appeared to Caiaphas, 
or Cephas, as some people say, which is also known as Peter. And then he came to the twelve. And then he appeared to more than how many? Five hundred people. Most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, one untimely born, he appeared to me. And I'm the least of the apostles. I'm I'm unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am who I am because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of those people, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it be I or they, we preach. And so you believed. He essentially says here that there are eyewitness accounts for the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You got one eyewitness account, you can make a case. You got over 500, it's a sealed deal. On the presence of two or more witnesses, a case could be validated. And Paul just gave all of the evidence that Christ not only rose, but he appeared to us. In Matthew chapter 18, it says, Every matter may be established by testimony of two or three witnesses. And Paul just gave us hundreds. Consequence one, if Jesus didn't raise, your preaching is useless. Two, faith is useless. Three, apostles would be lying. Four, you would still be in your sins. Look at verse 17, the second part of that. Now here's my question. And I hope the Corinthians heard this and I hope that we hear this. If we're still in our sin, then why did Christ die a sinless man for the sins of the world. Why would a righteous man die for the sins of the world? Jesus' death would have accomplished nothing. Christ dead without any resurrection would leave you and I condemned, not able to justify ourselves. That is the one question that I ask, and you should ask people too as you come in contact with them. If they don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, how do you rectify your sins? I'm so curious with people who don't know Jesus. How do you rectify your sins? Because we can get in the category with all humanity and people would say, I have done something wrong. Okay, first of all, what is your standard of right and wrong? Second of all, how do you justify your rights from your wrongs? And you know what people do? They say, well, I'm a good person. As opposed to who? Your neighbor? You should meet some of my neighbors. I got some new ones. And let me tell you what, like, mm, it's debatable on who's better. Kevin, <clears throat> who are you comparing yourself to? Because I guarantee you, they got some skeletons in their closet, right? How do you justify your rights from your wrongs? Is there a scoreboard in the sky that you look at every morning and you wake up and you go, okay, I got 17 wins and 15 losses. And how do you know what's a good deed and what isn't a good deed? What is your standard of truth? Where do you get the truth? Do you go to social media to get the truth? Do you go to a dictionary to get the truth? Where do you go? So what we see here is if Jesus didn't die for our sins, then we all stand guilty. How do we make up for that sin? Paul says, listen, Corinthian church, we're not guilty in our sins because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As believers, we're not still in sin because of a raised Christ who has power over sin. Next week, we're going to talk about being alive in Christ. Come back. Bring your friends and family. Christ's resurrection day is your resurrection day. Christ's resurrection day is your resurrection day. The question is, are you willing to be planted in the ground so that you can be restored and raised? And look at in verse 18. He says, the fifth thing is, all who died believing in Christ would be lost. In the early church, Christ's resurrection changed the view of death. And for pagans, people that didn't believe in Jesus, death was the end of everything. It was an adversary, an enemy that defeated every single person. But for believers, Christ eliminates the sting of death. Death, as we look at it, is our gain. Philippians, he says, to die is a desire that I have to depart and be with Jesus. You know, we've had some interesting funerals these past couple of years at Community Gospel. And I'll do a funeral of people that don't know Jesus, and we'll sit at those funerals, and they cry this, this, this cry that is just horrendous. Because there's no hope. It's the end. 
But you go to a believer's funeral and these people sit there and they cry because they're grieving, but they know that death is not the end. It's just the beginning for us. And they say, but he's with Jesus. It's okay. I have comfort and peace that I cannot explain. I cannot articulate those things. When believers die, we're not mourned as people who are lost, but we're mourned as people who are alive. It's our sadness, but it's your gain, right? We have people who've been diagnosed with sicknesses and cancer, and they're like, hey, the worst thing that can happen might be the best thing that can happen, which is I could die, right? I could go be with Jesus. Paul's simply saying here, all those five consequences, he's bringing it home, and he says, listen, either Christ rose or it's all a lie. But that's foolishness. Look at verse 19. Look at how he closes this. This says, he says, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we're of all people to be pitied the most. You should pity us as believers, but I don't think you can pity believers because we live with a peace that passes all understanding. We live with a joy that's uncontainable. We live with wisdom that cannot be uh, combated against with the world. What is the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection do? Let me just give you a couple things. First of all, for our teenagers, it gives hope to you in the halls of the high school and the junior high. To know that there is something more out there. To know that you're not alone when you feel rejected. To those who are in college, it gives purpose in the pursuit that God has something in store for you with your giftedness. To those who labor in the workforce, it's a mission field. We go to work now so that we have mission. So that we can help people come to know who Jesus is. To husbands, it gives the reason to love their spouse like Christ. And to wives, it gives the same reason. And to both, it gives them the ability to forgive. If you know Jesus, you know forgiveness and you know love in a way that nobody else does. It gives parents cause to shepherd their children. Do you realize I'm a parent? There are so many times where I think to myself, this is a useless endeavor. Can you just amen with me just for a minute? I'm like, I tell you to do something and you don't do it and I'm confused. Because you have this free will in you. And it's a good thing, but a bad thing at the same time. But it gives purpose for Bethy and I to shepherd our kids. To raise them up in the ways of the Lord. It gives new meaning for those who are going to soon retire. That there's life after retirement. That you still have purpose. It gives hope to those who are knocking on death's door. To those who are sick. And their bodies are decaying. It shows all of us that when we trust Christ. Came, died, and rose again. And we place our faith in Him alone. This life carries on in a much more glorious way when we're gone. As I was studying for this message, I came across this, um, this story, and I think it's so, it's so interesting. This, this dad and, and his son, they were driving down the, the road in their pickup truck. It was a Ford. You guys are like, Fords are dumb. Whatever, okay? Just change it to Chevy then, and you'll be fine, okay? It was from Japan. <clears throat> <laughs> Some of you are like, even worse. Um, well, that's another sermon for another day. Okay, we're going to go back. So a dad and his son are driving down the road in a Honda Accord. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they got the windows down. It's a nice spring day, right? They're just hanging out, going to their next destination. They got the windows down, and all of a sudden a bee comes flying in to the car or truck or whatever it is in your mind. And the kid is deathly afraid of bees because he knows if he gets stinged, he's going to die. He's got horrible allergic reaction to bee stings, and so he's freaking out in the car. And the dad, in one swift motion, he just reaches over and he grabs that bee in, in his hand, and he looks at it like this, and the kid's looking at him, and he's just like, thank God. And then the dad lets him go. And the kid immediately goes back to freaking out like, Dad, what did you do? What did you do? Like, I'm going to get stung. And he reaches over to his son. He says, son, look at my hand. And the son looks down at the hand and he sees the stingers in his hand. And he says, listen, I took the sting out of the bee so that you wouldn't have to be worried and afraid. That's what Jesus does for us. 
when life throws all this stuff at us and we become terrified and petrified and afraid and we get nervous because we don't know the outcome of things, we can understand that a resurrected Jesus reached out on the cross, took a nail in his hand, and died for our sins. That's what Easter is all about. That's why we have hope. That's why in 1 Corinthians 15, if you go down, it says, O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is in the law. This is the victory that has overcome the world. Even our faith, our faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, this is, a, this is one of those messages that we just need to know. I think sometimes we, we want to make like application uh, where we're like, here, we're going to do these three things. We're going to do these four things. I just need to live with the knowledge of the fact that you came, died, and rose again. I need to be reminded that you reached out your hand at Calvary and you took the sting of death away from me that I don't need to be afraid, that we don't need to be afraid. That you showed us that we can be more than conquerors and we don't stand as condemned men and women when we place our faith and trust in you. But we stand redeemed and restored. So God, I pray very specifically for the congregation who's gathered here, those who are maybe punching in online or will hear it later that they would be reminded of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you came, died, and rose again. And if you are sitting in these pews and you think to yourself, Jordan, I'm so confused, I don't, I don't understand. And the Bible is so very simple, it's so very clear, that if you would confess that you are a sinner, which we all are, and believe in faith that Jesus Christ came, rose from the dead, you will have eternal life. It is by grace that you are saved through faith and trust. It is the foundation in which we stand as believers in Jesus Christ. The Bible so clearly articulates, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting eternal life. And that verse continues, and it says, Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world. He came into the world to save it, a sinner like you and me. And if you find yourself sitting in these pews this morning and you think, man, I don't have a relationship with Jesus, the first step for you is to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and you will be saved. Period. And so many of us who are gathered here today, God, we have made that decision to trust Christ. We believe in faith that Jesus came, died, and rose again. But sometimes we sit in that passenger seat of that car, God, and we start freaking out because of what life throws at us. And we see the enemy coming into our vision. And we see all of these things that transpire in front of us. And we get so scared and we get so nervous. We get so excited. And what we need to be reminded of this morning is just to look over and remember who's driving the car. That you have plans for us, not to harm us. That you have guidelines for us that you want us to follow according to your word. You have ways for us that you want us to walk in. But sometimes we think that our ways are greater than your ways and forgive us of that sin. And as we come before you to take the Lord's Supper, to take communion this morning, may we be reminded of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that gives us meaning and purpose, that gives us new existence, that gives us ability far beyond anything we could do by ourselves. As we remember Jesus this morning, as we remember our Creator, God, help us to come before you and to just take some time and just be in awe. Thank you for listening to the Community Gospel Church podcast. If you would like to support this ministry financially, simply log on to communitygospelchurch.com and click the Contribute tab.